Ireland has more surviving megalithic structures and earthwork forts than any other nation in Europe. This is not necessarily because the ancient builders of Ireland were particularly prolific, nor was it because of some deeply ingrained urge to protect our cultural heritage. Instead, it's because the people of Ireland have, traditionally, been scared shitless of them. The reason for all that fear is that they are widely believed to be the homes of the fairies. If you asked most Irish people if they believed in fairies, most of them would strenuously deny it. However, most of them would also never, ever go anywhere near or interfere with a fairy hill. Now the reason for the denial is that we were taught by a certain foreign power to be deeply ashamed of our own culture. The fear is because despite those efforts, that culture largely survives. Now the image of fairies as tiny gentle creatures with twinkly wings is largely an invention of Victorian era literature and had no real place in the prior oral tradition. In fact, in the oral tradition, fairies were seen in a far more sinister light. Usually regarded as cruel and capricious creatures, with very little thought or respect for human life, safety or feeling, as well as being aggressively territorial. Many fairy hills are actually ancient human structures, a kind of fort known as a wrath, and very few people would willingly interfere with a fairy's wrath for fear of incurring the fairy's wrath. Now there's many different kinds of structures that got referred to as fairy hills. So let's talk about that for a moment. Part one, home sweet home. Ireland is dotted with small hills and mounds that are clearly artificial. They're a little too isolated or a little too perfectly arranged, or a little too perfectly formed to be naturally occurring. All such hills and mounds get referred to as fairy hills and fairy forts, and receive all the caution associated with them. And most of these structures are, of course, man-made, but they weren't all made in the same time period or for the same reason. Now there's two main types. The first type were made in the Bronze Age by ancient Celts. Now, they were built as something called a ring fort. The structure of a ring fort is there would be a hill in the middle with a raised ditch around it upon which would sit a wooden fence. Now, there would sometimes be a wooden fence at the top of the hill, not always, and on the top of the hill there would be a fort. Sometimes at the centre of that second wooden fence, sometimes there wouldn't be a wooden fence there at all. The reason these were built is they were defensive. Up on the raised platform you could see attackers coming from quite a distance away and any attackers would have to fight while going uphill, which made their job an awful lot more difficult. It's over Anakin! I have the high ground! Now the second kind were older still. These were built by a pre-Celtic civilization as burial mounds, sort of like an earthern mausoleum. And of course, sometimes a Bronze Age Celt would come along and find one of these pre-Celtic burial mounds and think, ah sure, that's a great hill to build a fort on, and build their fort there. So occasionally some of them will be both. 
Now, of course, in the burial mounds, you find a good deal of grave goods, people being buried with some of their possessions, and on the sites that were Bronze Age forts, sometimes people would bury some of their possessions for safekeeping, or sometimes they might lose some of them. So, both locations are usually a treasure trove of archaeological artefacts. And that's a large part of why these locations are so often connected to stories of hidden and buried treasure. Though, of course, only the very brave or the very foolish would actually go looking for that treasure, and with very good reason. Part 2 Get off my lawn, you kids. As I said in the introduction to this video, fairies in Irish folklore are aggressively territorial. And this is why you will often see fairy hills as places that are choked with undergrowth, thorns and trees. Because nobody dares go in and clear them out. Roads have been diverted and building sites relocated because the original location had a fairy fort and people were scared of making the fairies angry. Because Irish folklore is full of stories about fairies remonstrating very harshly with people who trespass on their territory. The Hellfire Club a hunting lodge in the Dublin mountains, built with stones taken from a burial mound, had its roof blown off. And this was considered the revenge of the fairies for stealing the stones. In some stories, there is a rumour that a certain fairy hill has treasure inside. And someone goes out to dig for that treasure. This person is usually very harshly and often violently remonstrated with by fairies or by a treasure guardian, which is often a fairy creature in and of itself. In one story, a farmer was tired of their sheep getting caught in the brambles growing on a fairy hill on the farm, and went to cut them all down. Shortly after, the farmer's right hand developed a huge, painful swelling that lasted several years. When finally it was seen to by a doctor, the doctor pulled a single long, dark thorn from the swelling. And the farmer never so much as looked at the fairy hill again, thinking that the thorn was the punishment for chopping down the brambles. But the punishment of the fairies can vary. Sometimes it's something as simple as items going missing around the house and turning up in strange places. Sometimes it'll be violent apparitions appearing here and there, running all through the house. Sometimes it will be the sickness or death of livestock. And sometimes it will be the death of the person who did the trespassing themselves, or their family. Now, of course, in some stories, the human trespasser will do something beneficial for the fairies, or in some cases, is even brought there intentionally by the fairies themselves to perform some kind of favor. And in these instances, that individual is rewarded. Which brings us to our next part. Part 3. Tit for Tat. 
in the story called The Legend of Knock Grafton and its various variations, a hunchback finds his way inside a fairy hill. There he hears the fairies singing. A carefully listening to their music and considering their song, he interjects at a convenient point with extra lyrics. And the fairies are delighted with this favour he's done, helping them continue their song. And they reward him by removing his hump. There's also numerous stories in which a human is brought inside a fairy hill to perform some kind of task, for which they are usually rewarded with some kind of gift. Now, these stories nearly always involve music in some way. The human who is taken to help may be a musician. The task that is required may be musical. But usually the gift that is given to the human in return is of a musical nature. Sometimes it will be enhanced supernatural musical talent. Sometimes it will be a fairy instrument and sometimes the human will be given knowledge of a song that they'd never heard before, the ability to play it without having had to practice it or learn it or anything, which is cheating in my opinion. Now while the task they are required to perform is sometimes musical in nature, it more often requires interaction with iron or for the person to be a neutral third party to referee a sports game or make a judgment of some kind. But people who attempt to force this kind of obligation on the fairies, who try to intentionally do a favour with the idea of getting one out of the fairies, things usually end badly for them. In the legend of Knockrafton and its numerous variants, after the first hunchback returns, another of a less kind disposition overhears the story and he goes to the fairy hill. He hears the fairy singing and immediately just screams extra lyrics. The fairies are outraged by this and they give him the hump from the first hunchback. Zoe leaves as a double hunchback. While the fairies often do give musical gifts, including sometimes the knowledge of their own music, sometimes people take fairy music without permission. In some stories, there will be a person who is passing by a fairy hill at night. They will hear music coming from the fairy hill and they will stop and they'll listen and they'll memorize it and they'll wait until they think they have a fairly good idea of it. And they'll go home and they'll start practicing and they'll start playing it and they'll start playing it publicly. And this usually ends with the fairies suddenly violently and publicly, taking this person away to live in the fairy world and never be seen again. Now I know some people would think of that as a good thing, but if you've heard the stories, what actually happens to the people in the fairy world, I think they might reconsider. In any case, it would seem that the fairies are just as eager to protect their intellectual property rights as they are to protect their physical property. Unfortunately, however, simply avoiding fairy hills isn't quite enough. Part four, right of way. In the same way, that you don't want to build your house on top of a fairy hill. You usually don't want to build it in between two fairy hills either. You see, the fairies are often said to travel regularly between various hills, whether they are attacking an enemy or visiting a friend. And they always use very, very specific paths. 
that they very rarely stray from. And the fairies will not be inclined to simply go around any structure that you erect in their way without some kind of very, very serious bribery. Now in cases where it is a fence or a wall that has been erected in their way, it will often be found the next day vandalized or even entirely demolished. In cases where somebody has built their house in a fairy path, that house will usually exhibit many of the signs of a haunting. In these stories, items go missing, turning up at strange places. Things fall off the walls or off shelves for no readily apparent reason. Thundering noises of people running through the house or up and down the stairs, doors opening and slamming and closing. All kinds of things like this. Sometimes you leave in here an entire party of fairies dancing and singing in your kitchen all through the night. And in more extreme cases, you'd get violent behaviour reminiscent of poltergeist-like activity. This was feared to the extent that people would work very, very carefully in choosing the location of their home. They would spend hours with maps, plotting out direct lines between different fairy hills, even ones that were miles and miles apart from one another, simply to avoid incurring the wrath of the fairies upon their home. Fairy hills and fairy wraths were usually avoided by the people of Ireland. To enter or interfere with one was usually considered the action of somebody either very stupid or very brave. Now in the former category, we'd have treasure seekers or people just out exploring, but in the latter category, we would usually have Schlevines or fairy doctors. And these were people who usually lived out on the fringes of society who were thought to have some kind of connection to the fairies themselves. They were generally respected because they had a certain amount of medical skill or, or herbal knowledge but they were also not fully trusted by the members of their community. But they're a matter for a different video. Suffice to say that the fear and respect people had for fairy hills and fairy wraths was a huge part in how long these structures of immense archaeological significance have managed to last for so long on the landscape of Ireland. I hope you enjoyed watching this video on Fairy Hills. The topic of this video was actually decided by my patrons over on Patreon. All of my patrons get to vote on polls, deciding what topics I'll be covering in future, regardless of what tier they're pledged on. And speaking of which, they have also voted for me to cover changelings next and you can bet i'll be discussing the ableism inherent in changeling folklore a huge thank you to dan of darker larper and momo of momo o'brien for making their own little contributions for this video they brought me some excellent footage to work with i was delighted receiving it. Also, thank you to the great Ash Carp, first of her name, Keeper of the Magikarp and Empress of the Great Shiny Sea, Queequeg, all of my other patrons whose names you see scrolling along the screen here, all of my other patrons who are not pledging on that tier, anyone who watched the video to the end, anyone who has liked or shared or subscribed, because all of those things are actually surprisingly helpful in the never-ending battle against the algorithm gods. And do remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.